and welcome to Japan Diaries, the CNBC TV 18 special. I'm Shireen Bhan and we're coming to you from Tokyo and we're fortunate enough to catch the fag end of the cherry blossom season. Joining us today is a man who knows Japan very, very well, has spent five years here in the 80s. Uh, NK Singh, thank you very much for joining us on CNBC TV 18. India and Japan have had close ties historically as well. We have an uh, economic partnership agreement in place since 2011. Both sides are hoping to build on that uh, with this renewed momentum provided by Prime Minister Modi and Prime Minister Abe. Uh, as you stand here today and you look at what has been achieved over the last several years, uh, what stands out for you? Well, I think that what stands out is continuity and also transformational change. Continuity in the sense that the Japanese have had a special affection for India, look at the location of the Indian Embassy, mm. uh, given by the Japanese uh, next to the Imperial Palace, which is right, behind, uh, which is us, right behind, behind us as you speak. And this was a recognition of the fact that uh, the dissenting judgment of Justice Radha Binod Pal, who did not really consider the Japanese to be war criminals, but considered them to be people who carried out legitimate orders of the authority, no matter how cruel it was. Mm. And in recognition of this, they gave the prime location to the Indian Embassy, which is where the Indian Embassy is right now located next to the Imperial Palace. I think that we have never had political difficulties with Japan. Uh, we were one of the first recipients of the OECF, that's the uh, OECF assistance, which came through us through foreign aid. And of course, Japanese investments, when I was working here, remained shy. The Suzuki uh, uh, Maruti uh, particular arrangement of which, uh, in which I played also a role was transformational as a beginning of, of an automobile. But I think what has changed fundamentally is two things. No more is India regarded by the Japanese as merely a market. Mm. It's regarded as a, a place where, of course, consumption will rise rapidly as population begin the per capita incomes increase and demands and aspirations increase. So certainly they regard India to be also a competitive manufacturing hub. So I think that is one fundamental change. The second, Shireen, which is a very big fundamental change, is I never thought that in my lifetime mm. one would see really arrangements and cooperation in the field of security, and in, in the field of defense, in the field of armament production, and in terms of very high technology areas. That at the time when I was here was something which was reserved really for uh, a very exclusive set of, set of friends. And I think that the Chinese appetite for them, particularly at the Chinese market, the location of Japanese industry in China, remained an appetite which was un unsatiable. Mm. So I think that the fact that India has emerged with this rising per capita income, rising opportunity, is really a tectonic shift in the Japanese looking to India as a partnership which goes well beyond merely a market for consumption but embraces security and defense for a more stable and peaceful Asia. Mm -hmm. Speaking of opportunities, both Prime Minister Abe and Prime Minister Modi uh, have been reviewing what has happened since he visited uh, Japan in 2014 and of course he chose Japan to be the first country that he visited after he took office. Uh, we have an FTA in place with Japan. Uh, Japan is now the third largest investor into India. But what more needs to be done to attract the kind of money that Japan is sending into China and perhaps now looking at relocating out of China? How can India capitalize on that opportunity? Well, I think a couple of things. I think that uh, it's a very important point which you have raised uh, because it is true that the Japanese industry is looking at alternative locations outside China and India is one very obvious destination but I think that uh, we need to pursue some of the things initiatives which have begun we need to make the ease of business even better than what it is today particularly on enforcement of contracts on dispute resolution on genuinely the initiatives now in the recent budget on codifying labor laws encouraging state governments to be able to pursue labor policies we do make their manufacturing more competitive and of course the continued with our tax policies and tax regimes becoming more and more competitive. Getting the state governments on board a more harmonious policy where there isn't this quick changes of policy, what they feel is the unpredictability of Indian policy, the, what was done by the earlier regime of retrospective taxation mm -hmm. has damaged us quite a bit and the commitment that we will never really have retrospective changes and assurance of a fair amount of continuity in tax policies 
along with the other changes on the ease of doing business, will, I think, begin to make a decisive difference. Uh, one of the areas where we could see a decisive difference being made is in the area of infrastructure. Uh, Japan is partnering with India, whether it's the Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor or, in fact, the high-speed railway project, uh, the Ahmedabad-Mumbai project. Uh, there are questions on the viability of this project. There are questions on uh, how are you going to be able to balance the challenge of cost and tariff, especially in a country like India. Uh, what has the experience been like here in Japan, and how do we ensure that this project is actually viable and takes off in India? The groundbreaking ceremony is expected later this year. Work will start in 2018. Uh, I'm told that the schedule uh, of meeting the deadline of 2023 24 is on track. You're a member of the International High Speed Railway Association. What's your take? Well, my take is that these questions which are being raised in India are, uh, are really your questions which were raised by Japan when Japan itself was beginning to embark on Shinkansen, on whether this kind of cost economics would work out. But one thing which has been proved is when it comes to high speed rail, this is an area where conventional economic breaks down. This is an area where supply creates its own demand. I mean, right now, if you begin to predict what is the likely traffic volume based on current supply-side responses, you would get one particular. But when the supply of very rapid transport is available, it brings about a cultural change. It brings about a social transformation of the whole region, which becomes more rapidly integrated. This has been Japan's experience. I have every reason to believe this will be India's experience too. And I think that the benefits of this will go far beyond this rapid connectivity between Mumbai and Ahmedabad. It will go to improving technology. It will bring about a qualitative change in which we look at railways as, a, a, as an investment. It will bring about a rapid change in the way in which we take steps to improve the the technology and the innovation in bringing about railways as a means of communication on the basis of which this country has grown. Mm. You wouldn't be surprised that, for instance, uh, when I took the plane a day for yesterday from Narita to Nagoya, there was hardly anybody in the plane. This is because in the country, and there were 300 kilometers, for a country which provides this kind of assured railway connectivity, nobody would be taking uh, the the plane as a mode of transportation. So I think that the real benefit of this Shinkansen, which the Prime Minister has taken a decisive decision, will bring about a, a change in attitudes of work, in skills, in innovation, and this is a pilot project which will have transformational and multiplied benefits for the Indian economy as a whole. Hmm. Uh, what are the lessons that uh, can be learned from the Japanese experience in the railways? I mean, in terms of safety, I think the track record is unparalleled. Uh, in terms of turning trains around, cleanliness, safety, I mean, these are things that uh, Suresh Prabhu was talking about in India. But what do you believe the lessons that can be learned from the Japanese experience? Also, the crucial issue of uh, developing developing the real estate along these railway lines, which has been a big uh, sort of, uh, you know, a big factor in how it's been proven to be successful here in Japan? Well, I think the, the lessons, as you say, are multiple. Uh, it's an experience, I mean, if you watch the film, it's a very nice film called One Day in the Life of Shinkansen. As you see, the first Shinkansen uh, rollout or at 5 a.m. in the morning or 5.30 and then stream in at 12. Actually, what happens between 12 and 5 in the morning is something amazing where each track, each compartment, each wagon is thoroughly checked, electrical fittings, the safety of the tracks and that those five hours are crucial period which has ensured the fact that when I attended two years ago the 50 years of the celebration of the Shinkansen they proudly read out that in the 52 years or 50 years of Shinkansen, there had not been one accident, there had not been one derailment, there had not been one collision. This is a kind of a transformational mindset change. The way in which, for instance, you say when the train arrives within a particular stipulated three minutes, the whole compartment is cleaned, each person who goes in who has an assigned task. But I think that uh, the present uh, railway minister and the leadership of the prime minister realizes that these are things which can be replicated with some change in the attitude to work and some change in being able to instill discipline. It is certainly possible to emulate 
this particular thing in the Indian context because it is a replicable example of how rapidly and how quickly trains can be turned around, clean for the next journey and also I think what is important is what I said, the 12 p.m. to the 5 a.m. phenomena of the maintenance of tracks. No doubt our railway tracks are far bigger and more diverse than what it is in Japan. But I think we do need to learn how to maintain and renew our tracks and renew really ensure electrical wirings and so on to try and eliminate the kinds of uh, some of the unfortunate accidents which you have had.